This passage is really about the vitally important journey from immaturity to Christian maturity and the role that trials play in that process. Heavenly Father, speak to us and change us by the power of your Spirit through your word of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. The other week I saw a repeat episode of Lewis, the Morse spin-off TV detective series. At one point, Lewis was in a conversation and he explained that his wife had been killed in a hit-and-run car accident. He had loved her very much and he'd found her loss devastating. And Lewis's comment on his terrible bereavement is that it was an end to what he calls any God stuff for him. Of course, it's fiction. But it reflects a common assumption that any really hard experience is bound to decrease or destroy Christian faith. The really astonishing thing about our Bible passage this evening is that it teaches the exact opposite. Tough times grow real faith. The passage, as you'll be aware by now, is James 1, 1 to 18. It's there on page 1011 in the Bibles. Please have that open in front of you. My title as we look at this opening section of James is Faith on Trial. You can see my four-point outline on the back of the service sheet. Have that also in front of you if you would. And I'll come to that in uh, a moment. To begin at the beginning, though, take a look at verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Who is this James? The traditional and most likely view is that this is James, the brother of Jesus, who became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He's writing to people he calls the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Who are they? Well, not Jews only, but Christian believers, both Jewish and Gentile, who are the new and true Israel, the people of God, scattered across nations and provinces of the Roman Empire. Possibly the background here is the scattering that happened as a result of the persecution that followed the martyrdom of Stephen in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And if that is so, then James could have especially in mind, uh, not exclusively though, uh, believers who had been part of that Jerusalem church that he was the leader of and uh, who had been forced to flee through those tough times of persecution. That would make good sense of the fact that he immediately speaks about faith under pressure. Be that as it may, it is faith on trial that is the overarching theme of this section from verse 1 through to verse 18 that we're looking at this evening. So verse 2, as we've already heard this evening, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And down in verse 12 as well, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Now some think that James moves from one topic to another in a rather disconnected way through this first chapter of his letter. To my mind, this whole section is illuminated if we see it as all related to this theme of faith on trial. Or to look at it from a different angle, this passage is really about the vitally important journey from immaturity to Christian maturity and the role that trials play in that process. Hence my four headings that you can see there on the outline. First, where we begin, ungodly immaturity. Secondly, where we end, godly maturity. Thirdly, how we get there by responding to the word of God in the thick of our trials. And fourthly, how to grow to maturity, a 10-point plan. Now let me explain where all that comes from. So first of all, where we begin. 
ungodly immaturity. What is the character of this ungodly immaturity? It is foolish, faithless, unstable, and it blames God for its problems. What is the consequence of having this kind of spiritually immature character? It is that we find ourselves caught up in the life cycle of sin that leads to death. This destructive character you see first of all in verses 5 to 8. Here they are. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So here is someone who's lacking in wisdom. Biblical wisdom is a combination of knowing how to live in a godly way and putting what you know into practice. The opposite of that kind of wisdom is folly. With that kind of folly comes doubt. And this is an honest doubt that asks sensible questions and sincerely wants to learn the truth. This is a failure to see God for who he is, a failure to trust him. It is being faithless. And being foolish and faithless makes for tremendous mental and personal instability here. So the picture here is of a restless, storm-driven sea constantly surging first one way and then the other. No sense of direction, no settled purpose, no peace. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What then is the default attitude when troubles come? Blame God. Verse 13 is the warning against this. Let no one say when he is tempted, when he is tested, when he is under trial. Let no one say, I am being tempted by God. To say that is to say when we succumb to temptation, is to say that when we succumb to temptation and fall into sin, it is not our fault. We couldn't help it. It's God's fault. But once we have absolved ourselves of responsibility for our folly and our moral failures, then we are on a very steep and slippery slope with the brakes off. There is nothing to stop the downward slide. And that's exactly the vicious downward spiral that's described in verses 14 and 15. This is the consequence that flows from ungodly immaturity that's faithless, foolish, unstable, and blame-shifting. Verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's a powerful and frightening image of what you might call three generations of sin. The mother is our self-centered desire that latches on to temptations. We think that here are opportunities for us to get what we want. Never mind the cost, never mind God. So desire meets temptation, and what's conceived grows bigger and bigger until desire gives birth to sin. The mother is desire. The daughter is sin. But then sin grows to adulthood, and in its turn gives birth to death. It's a ghastly picture. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to scare us off. We don't want to go down that road. There is a far, far better way than ungodly immaturity with its wayward character and deadly consequences. And by the grace of God, we can hope for that better way. We can have a better goal for what we will become as we journey through life. So secondly, where we end, godly maturity. This godly maturity is everything that ungodly immaturity isn't. So instead of being faithless, we become faithful. Foolishness gives way to wisdom. No longer tossed about like a wave on the stormy sea, we become stable. And rather than blaming God, we have a consistent love for God instead. 
And the consequence of this godly maturity is that we find ourselves, by the grace of God, anticipating what James calls the crown of life, eternal life. So verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. In other words, the end result of this process will be that you will have God-given wisdom. You'll be wise. That's the goal. And verse 6, but let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. The mature believer is a faithful believer, looking to God for what they need, trusting that God will provide it. You can see that stability there in verse 4. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Consistent, unwavering, stable faithfulness marks the one who becomes perfect and complete. Such people are everything they were meant to be. They display all the fruit of the Spirit. They don't do that erratically so that one day you can rely on them, the next day you can't. Nobody knows from one day to the next how they're going to respond to difficulties or to provocation. They do so, they respond with a steadiness that other people can rely on completely. Now, of course, nobody is going to be totally perfect and complete this side of heaven. We wait for the resurrection life to be 100% perfect and mature. But the goal is to make progress now, even though we never arrive, not yet, not till then, not till the new age. Then how the mature person relates to God and how God relates to them is clear in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Instead of blaming God, the mature believer loves him. God is number one. God is at the center always. And God will bless such a person and give them the crown of life. We begin by displaying ungodly immaturity. By the grace of God, when we become believers, we know that we will end with godly maturity. And we spend our lives moving towards that maturity. That is our destination. It's what we long to become. But how? So, thirdly, how we get there? By responding to the word of God in the thick of our trials. Take a look at verses 2 and 3 to see this process at work. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Whatever comes at us that we find difficult... This is how we're to deal with it. So in general, such a trial can be an inner enticement to sin or it can be external afflictions, particularly persecution for our faith, but not only that. So we can include illness. And at the end of this very letter, in 5 verses 13 and 14, James asks the question, is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone among you sick? Illness in one form is one form of suffering that James clearly has in mind as he writes this letter. Or it might be financial trouble and poverty. And early in chapter 2, James speaks of the poor man in shabby clothes. So that kind of hardship, too, is in his mind. So these are trials, he says, of various kinds. And God uses them to test our faith. The image there is of the process by which silver or gold is refined by fire. As someone has put it, suffering is a means by which faith, tested in the fires of adversity, can be purified of any dross and thereby strengthened. And that purification takes place when we find ourselves in the thick of trials and we respond with faith and obedience to the word of God. So verse 18 of his, of God's own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. By this word of truth, God created us. He regenerated us. And by that same word of truth, he is transforming us into the likeness of Christ as we hear 
and as we obey. When we talk of faith in Christ that's been tested and refined by suffering, that it shines like gold, refined gold. I wonder whether examples come to your mind, people you have known over the years. When I think about that, my mind turns to a man I met years ago, 30 years ago, when I was on a a mission team as a theological student to a rather small, struggling church in the West Country. He was an old man. He was a member of the church. And I was sent to visit him, supposedly, to challenge and encourage him in his uh, faith. I was a young man in my mid-twenties. But the challenge and the encouragement was entirely the other way around. This man had loved Christ for many, many years. His daughter had been horribly and randomly murdered some years before. Despite his own great physical frailty, he had nursed his beloved wife through a long, debilitating, and finally fatal illness, and he'd been left alone. He could so easily have become an embittered old man. There was no doubting the suffering that he'd been through. I could see it in his eyes as I talked to him about his life, and he told me what he'd been through. And yet, and yet, those eyes also shone with joy. As he spoke, the living faith and the hope in Christ that he had poured out of him. It's 30 years since I met him, but the impression of that meeting is still deep in my soul. Refined, mature, and joyful faith. I want to become like that. And we grow in that kind of godly maturity by responding to the word of God in the thick of our trials. Let me unpack that a bit more. So finally and fourthly, how to grow to maturity, a 10-point plan. You can see these 10 points on the outline. Want maturity. Obviously, that's the starting point. If we don't want it, we're not going to do anything about it. Then ask for maturity. Pray for it. Persistently petition the Lord to grow your godly maturity. That is a prayer that God will answer with a big yes. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, and remember that's knowing how to live and living like it. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. When you pray that way, don't be surprised when the Lord starts using trials and troubles in your life to test and refine your faith. So, find the joy in trials. Verse 3, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That is a clear and uncompromising command. We are called on to make a definite decision to take up a joyful attitude in our lives. That in itself is a life-changing lesson. It does not mean that suffering ceases to hurt. But it means that joy comes alongside the suffering. And it becomes possible to find the joy in trials when we understand that God uses trials to grow our faith and maturity. Remember, it's through our response to his word in the thick of these things that maturity grows. Be prepared to wait, verse 4, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That takes time. The refining process is not instant. There is no instant gratification when it comes to spiritual maturity. Demands patient endurance. Take the long view. So look at verses 9 to 11. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. 
When we apply that to this process of faith refining trials, then we look forward to the exaltation. When we're in the depths, poverty stricken in one way or another, we can look ahead to the day when God will raise us up. And that has the immediate effect of lifting our spirits now. What is more, we learn to welcome the humiliation. That is, if we meet trials when things are going well, when we're prospering, when we meet trials when we're in that kind of position in our lives, then we can welcome the fact that we've been protected from depending on our bank balance or our health or whatever it might be in order that we might learn more trust in God. We can welcome the humiliation. So whatever comes your way, remain steadfast. Verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. That is staying power, a refusal to be blown off course or to become embittered, endurance. As someone has commented, this is not a meek, passive submission to circumstances, but a strong, active, challenging response in which the satisfying realities of Christianity are proven in practice. Don't. Blame God. Verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. And finally, be thankful for the working of God's grace through trials. Verses 16 to 18, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The godly maturity that results from the fire of faith-refining trials in our lives is one of the very greatest of God's gifts to us. Thank God for it. It leads to the crown of life. Let's bow our heads to pray. Lord God, by your Spirit, at work through your word, give us the grace to learn through the trials that we face in our lives. Grow us, we pray, to godly maturity. In Jesus' name, amen.